Hello, all you freedom-loving people. Welcome to another episode of Front Page. I'm your host, Scott Cameron Goulet. The ATF has finalized controversial regulations that will expand background checks for gun sales. Faced with mounting pressure, House Speaker Mike Johnson is negotiating the terms of aid to Ukraine with the White House. Johnson hopes that this will satisfy the international community's call for the United States to send more aid to Ukraine. And Johnson also hopes that the policy changes demanded by the Republican Party will also be realized. As President Trump's court battles heat up, the DOJ admitted that Fannie Willis has misappropriated federal funds. O.J. Simpson has died. He was an icon of the American dream for a generation, but his legacy to the world is more than just the realization and destruction of the American dream. U.S. economic data is strong, yet voters are very unhappy with the state of the actual economy. So what is the problem? Alien UFOs are incredibly secretive. So how do they do it? A Harvard professor explains. Based on newly disclosed emails, a top advisor to Dr. Anthony Fauci secretly messaged a zoologist, Dr. Dajic, who funneled money from Dr. Fauci's agency to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And a top secret memo reveals that Justin Trudeau was advised against publicly criticizing the CCP. Okay, let's get into it. A proposed rule from the ATF will soon take effect. This will change the definition of what it means to be engaged in the business of dealing in firearms. This requirement is not intended for licensed federal firearm dealers who are already required to use NICS on every firearm sale and or transfer. The recent proposed rule allows the ATF to focus on private, unlicensed Americans who may sell guns at some point in any given year, just as Americans have sold guns to each other since 1791, the year of the Second Amendment ratification. The ATF's rule changes the wording so that there is no clear line between private gun sales and sales of firearms by FFL holders. This forces each seller to prove that they are not selling for profit in order to avoid being required to make sure that the purchaser undergoes an NICS check before possessing a firearm. The change of the rule will effectively end private transactions that possibly include the inheritance of firearms within families. By expanding point of sale background checks, the government will encroach more into our private lives and it will also enable the government to better locate all firearms in the United States by expanding the paper trail for firearms. Because there was no retail background check requirement prior to 1993, there are no paper trails for traditional firearms that were sold during the more than 200 years of history prior to that date. Now, by extending NICS to private sales, the ATF is able to begin to increase the written record of these firearms so that they can be included in the system. Second Amendment advocates have said that the new rule is the next step in the Biden administration's plan to implement gun control measures through administrative action that it can't get through legislative process. Aiden Johnston, the Director of Federal Affairs for the Gun Owners of America said, once again, the Biden administration is weaponizing every tool in their toolbox to intimidate, harass, and criminalize gun owners with unlawful executive actions. This backdoor universal registration check rule is nothing more than a move to criminalize the sale of a single gun without a background check. By doing so, the government hopes to ensure that they are fully involved in every firearm transfer and eventually the records of all those transfers will end up in their records database. Attorney General Merrick Garland signed the new rule on April 10th and it will become effective on May 10th, 2024. House Speaker Mike Johnson is in talks with the White House to advance U.S. military aid to Ukraine and Israel. House Republican leader Steve Scalise told the Associated Press on Thursday that the new package, unlike the $95 billion foreign security assistance bill passed by the Senate, would add several GOP demands. Scalise said, there's been no agreement reached. Obviously, there would have to be an agreement reached, not just with the White House, but with our own members. Meanwhile, Mike Johnson met with President Trump today at Mar-a-Lago 
Johnson sought President Trump's advice on Ukraine funding in an effort to gain his support. Senator Mark Wayne Mullen, an Oklahoma Republican who often works closely with House lawmakers, said this week that he and President Trump have spoken with Johnson in depth about how to advance Ukraine aid. Mullen is hoping to get President Trump behind the package. In addition, Mike Johnson has been negotiating with the White House on legislation that would partially fund Ukraine in the form of a loan. This would pave the way for U.S. access to frozen Russian central bank assets, among other policy changes. Johnson has also been pushing the Biden administration to lift the moratorium on liquefied natural gas exports. At times, Johnson has also called for changes in policy along the U.S. border with Mexico. The Department of Justice, the DOJ, has confirmed that District Attorney Fannie Willis may have misused federal funding. A DOJ spokeswoman said in a statement, during our review of the award to respond to this inquiry, we have noticed some inconsistencies in what Fulton County has reported to the federal subaward reporting system, and we are working with them to update their reporting accordingly. A whistleblower, former Willis staffer Amanda Timpson, previously accused the Fulton County Office of mishandling $488,000 in federal grants to pay for gifts, computers, and travel expenses. Willis later fired Timpson. On Wednesday, Andrew Kerr, a reporter for the Washington Free Beacon, reported it's that same grant that the Justice Department's Office of Justice Programs now says is plagued with purporting discrepancies from Willis's office. The $488,000 federal grant was earmarked for the creation of a center for youth empowerment and gang prevention in Atlanta. The grant ended in September of 2023, but the center was never opened. Representative Jim Jordan, the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, subpoenaed Willis in early February for records related to the $488,000 federal grant. Willis provided only a narrow collection of documents unrelated to Timson Whistleblower's allegations. Moreover, Fannie Willis wrote in her response that Jordan's request was unreasonable and uncustomary. Willis implied that Jordan's investigation was designed to undermine her election interference case against President Trump. On March 14th, Jordan threatened to hold Willis in contempt of Congress. During a Thursday interview on Fox News, Jim Jordan said that his office has talked with the whistleblower and the former Willis office employee is giving information to House Republicans. Jordan said, now the Department of Justice is looking into this, all kinds of problems with Fannie Willis and this ridiculous investigation she's run on President Trump and others. O.J. Simpson has died. He was 76 years old. The family said in a statement on X on Thursday, on April 10th, our father, Arenthal James Simpson, succumbed to his battle with cancer. Simpson was among the best and most popular athletes in the late 1960s and 1970s. However, the public will remember the football star and Hollywood actor best for the trial that ended with his acquittal to determine whether he had killed his ex-wife. In 1994, O.J. Simpson's ex-wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, the mother of two of his children, was found dead. Her friend, Ron Goldman, a waiter who had come to her home to return a pair of eyeglasses that she left behind at a restaurant, was lying a few feet away, stabbed to death. Simpson was accused of killing them both. Simpson was ordered to surrender to police, but five days after the murder, he fled with his passport and a former teammate in a white Ford Mustang, disguised. A slow-moving manhunt through the Los Angeles area ended at Simpson's mansion, and he was later indicted on murder charges. What followed was one of the most dramatic American trials of the 20th century. The case had it all. A wealthy celebrity defendant, a black man accused of killing his white ex-wife out of jealousy, a woman killed after divorcing a domestically abusive man, and a dream team of expensive and charismatic defense attorneys. Prosecutors argued that O.J. Simpson killed Nicole out of jealousy, and they provided extensive blood, hair, and fiber test results that tried to prove O.J. Simpson was the murderer. O.J. Simpson declared himself absolutely 100% innocent at the outset of the case. His attorneys argued that the celebrity defendant was framed by racist white police officers. The prosecutors 
made an unforgettable mistake during the back and forth between the two sides. They instructed O.J. Simpson to try on a pair of blood-stained gloves that were found at the murder scene. They believed that they would fit Simpson's hands perfectly and would prove he was the killer. But they forgot the fact that blood-stained gloves shrink as the blood dries up. In a dramatic demonstration, O.J. Simpson struggled to put on the gloves and told the jury they didn't fit. Alan Dershowitz, who was one of Simpson's defense attorneys, later called the prosecution's decision to require O.J. Simpson to try on the gloves the biggest legal blunder of the 20th century. The trial lasted 16 months and O.J. Simpson was acquitted on October 3, 1995 by a predominantly black jury of 10 women and two men. The trial touched the entire United States and had repercussions in other countries. Then President Bill Clinton left the Oval Office at the White House to watch the verdict on a secret television, but O.J. Simpson's legal problems were far from over. Goldman and Brown's family subsequently filed a wrongful death lawsuit against O.J. Simpson in civil court. In 1997, a jury in Santa Monica, California, which was predominantly white, found O.J. Simpson liable for both deaths. He was ordered to pay $33.5 million in damages. On October 3, 2008, exactly 13 years after his acquittal in the murder case, he was charged with robbery and kidnapping for attempting to steal back some of his sports memorabilia from a Los Angeles hotel room. Simpson was sentenced to 33 years in prison, but he only spent nine years in prison. He was released on parole in 2017, and he moved into a gated community in Las Vegas. At the age of 74, he received an early release from parole in 2021 due to good behavior. Overall employment figures that have been reported have looked quite bright over the past few years. In a climate of high inflation and rising interest rates, the United States has reported that we have not only recovered the jobs that were lost due to the government enforced lockdowns during the COVID-19 epidemic, but the U.S. has also added millions of new jobs. They say in 2023, the U.S. economy added about 3 million new jobs, and starting in 2024, more than 800,000 new jobs have been already added. But a close look at the household survey in the jobs report reveals a bleaker picture. Employment among native-born Americans has been declining over the past four years. This means that all of the job growth has gone to foreign-born laborers, both legal and illegal. The number of legal and illegal immigrants working in the U.S. increased by 3.4 million from February of 2020 to March of 2024. This is according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Meanwhile, the number of native-born U.S. workers declined by 78,000 during the same period. In addition, a Brookings Institution study found that roughly twice as many illegal immigrants entered the U.S. as legal immigrants during the Biden administration. Stephen Moore, an economist who served as President Trump's economic advisor, says that illegal immigrants are distorting data on the job market. He believes that the U.S. economy desperately needs more legal immigrants with high skills or special talents rather than less educated illegal immigrants. The United States Bureau of Labor Statistics includes illegal immigrants in its labor statistics, referring to them as undocumented workers. However, the agency does not publicly disclose this data. Rather, they lump together employment data for both legal and illegal immigrants. Another problem with more illegal immigration is that it depresses the paychecks of American workers. According to economist E.J. Anthony, a fellow at the Heritage Foundation, President Joe Biden is polling so poorly with voters in part because it's not the voters themselves who are getting the jobs. In another attention-grabbing development, the federal government's monthly job report has seen a series of unusual downward revisions. Each month, financial markets focus on the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics Employment Report. However, economists and market analysts have noticed a trend over the past year. Monthly releases from the Bureau of Labor Statistics have been quietly and significantly revised downward after their initial release. 
For example, the Bureau of Labor Statistics reported on February 13th that the U.S. economy added 353,000 jobs in January. This was considerably better than expected. However, the agency said on April 5th that the January figure has now been revised downward by 97,000 jobs to 256,000 jobs. Adjustments similar to this are common. The agency has made downward revisions in 12 of the past 14 months, totaling nearly 585,000 job losses. Critics on social media were quick to question the motives of the Bureau of Labor Statistics, suggesting that a large number of corrections were due to illegal immigration. In the past two years, the topic of UFOs has begun to be discussed in mainstream society. People may wonder how these flying objects can come and go as they please. Avi Loeb, a renowned astrophysicist at Harvard University, explains that these unidentified flying objects may have traveled through extra dimensions to reach Earth. Avi Loeb is known for his work on extraterrestrial life. He believes that extraterrestrial visitors may be traveling in hidden spaces. Scientists at the European Organization for Nuclear Research, CERN, are using a particle accelerator to unravel these spaces. The particle accelerator, known as the Large Hadron Collider, allows beams of protons to travel in orbit at speeds close to the speed of light, reconstructing conditions similar to those of the Big Bang. This will allow scientists to learn more about how matter and the universe were created using the Large Hadron Collider. CERN scientists are attempting to detect six additional dimensions of space-time and to look for specific particles as evidence of the existence of these spaces. In a new documentary titled The Paranormal UFO Connection, Loeb suggests that extraterrestrial civilizations have been developing the technology to travel through different dimensions for billions of years. Loeb said that the aliens use quantum gravity technology in order to travel through curled spaces. Particle accelerators such as the Large Hadron Collider can only detect this. If aliens were to arrive on Earth using such technology, people would be amazed because we don't have anything like this. Loeb said, just like a cave dweller coming to a city like London and seeing all the technological gadgets there. He explained that quantum mechanics was discovered about a century ago. The most advanced technologies that people use today, such as the internet and artificial intelligence, were developed based on this understanding of quantum mechanics. But this learning process is incomplete and there are still some major unanswered questions in modern physics. According to newly disclosed emails, a top advisor to Dr. Anthony Fauci secretly messaged a zoologist who funneled money from Dr. Anthony Fauci's agency to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. The advisor, Dr. David Morens, sent at least four messages to Peter Dajic, the zoologist and president of EcoHealth Alliance. The emails were obtained and released by the U.S. House of Representatives Select Subcommittee on the Pandemic. Dr. Morens wrote from his personal email to Dajic and others on April 26, 2020, on July 13, 2020, and on February 20, 2022. At least three of the messages were about a grant from the U.S. National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, the NIAID, to Dajic's EcoHealth. This was to study bat coronaviruses. Then EcoHealth funneled the money from that grant to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Subsequently, the subject line of one message noted actions needed regarding. Dajic told Dr. Morens that the NIAID grant officer said, he's unable to talk with me anymore about our suspended grant. President Trump's administration suspended the grant on April 24, 2020, after the COVID-19 pandemic started. However, President Joe Biden's administration restored funding in 2023. Yet later, the Wuhan lab was suspended and barred from receiving the funds. In a 2023 report, an inspector general determined that EcoHealth and the National Institutes of Health, the NIH, failed to monitor the Wuhan research properly. 
EcoHealth also failed to provide the documents that the NIH requested following the emergence of COVID-19. EcoHealth blamed this failure on the lack of cooperation from CCP officials. Dr. Morin said that he retained very few emails or documents on the origins of COVID-19. Dr. Morin's also said that he continues to request that correspondence on sensitive issues be sent to his private email address. Dr. Morin's also said in another email, I try to always communicate on Gmail because my NIH email is FOIA'd constantly. He said, I'll delete anything I don't want to see in the New York Times. On April 11th, Representative Brad Wenstrup, the chairman of the subcommittee, said that the newly acquired email showed further attempts by Dr. Morin's to subvert public transparency. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was advised in a secret 2017 memo against publicly criticizing China. The June 29, 2017 memo from cabinet aides came while Ottawa was negotiating a Chinese free trade agreement. The memo, which was obtained by a Black Locks reporter, reads, the Canadian Security Intelligence Service describes Chinese foreign influence activities in Canada as sophisticated, pervasive, and persistent. Although there are other countries conducting foreign influence activities in Canada, the People's Republic of China is the most active. The censored five-page memo is marked top secret. Aides told Trudeau not to talk about China negatively despite the document specifically mentioning China 28 times. The memo said, This is a very sensitive issue and public efforts to raise awareness should remain general and not single out specific countries to avoid potential bilateral incidents. It added that CCP agents attempted to influence the outcomes of Canadian elections, to pressure or influence Canadian officials, and to influence the publication of Canadian media content which portrays the Chinese government negatively. The memo stated that Chinese agents also used intimidating and threatening behavior against Chinese Canadian dissidents. This kind of threatening behavior by CCP agents could be deemed illegal by Canadian courts. Canadians who are of Chinese ethnicity and those who are publicly critical of CCP policies are the ones who are most frequently subject to such threatening behavior from CCP agents, and yet Trudeau was told to remain silent. Okay, this is our show for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you like what you heard today, please don't forget to like this video and share it with your friends and family because everybody deserves to know the truth.